I would have loved to have brought Brisker with me, like I said, and, and it really is. And I, I believe that there are people that can get that out of the carpet. Um, <laughs> but I don't know how that would have all, all gone down. I've not ridden him into a building yet. Um, I can, the fun thing about him is he can fit, he's kind of like me, he can fit through any opening that his gut will fit through. <laughs> He just has to roll his horns back to, to get it done. Um, but I'm, I'm just honored to be with you. Thanks for your flexibility with the weather and all. And I amen. That is a tough call. And you're down to because, you know, you have hopes and you're waiting. Lord, will you? And I'm watching the radar, too, and saying it'll go north. No, it's not staying. Well, it'll go north. No, it's, it's all right. Um, and so as I hopped out of the vehicle and it was still drizzling, I'm like, good call. <laughs> That's a good call. Uh, I always affirm kids with this fact that underneath all the clothing that they have, they are waterproof. So that's true of you too. Um, but it's not comfortable to sit in the rain. Uh, so it's good to be good to be inside. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be together today, Amen. for sure. And I appreciate the ministry that happens in and through this church. And even that's a tough, that's a tough lead in. You're going to remember this. Now, and, and if it was on me, then I would say, Ooh, that's that's a tough bill. That's 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 a tough thing to say. You're going to remember what I should. But it's, it's not. It's about what God has for you today. Right. Because God wants to meet with you today. He desires to do that. And I want to talk to you just briefly. And I say briefly because um, I got a time slot and Steve's going to flag me. But I got a passage I want to share with you that I'm going to tell you I'm just scratching the surface of. And in Psalm chapter 63 and in Psalm 63, David is writing uh, this passage, this psalm, at a, at a just really challenging time in his life. And we get an insight, maybe greater insight, into this relationship that David has with his God in circumstances that at the season in life he's going, that he's going through these things, would have been easy for him to say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Psalm, David finds himself in Psalm 63 in, in the wilderness. In fact, the whole psalm starts out the fact that he's in the wilderness of Judah writing these words. And I'll share with you why this has been such an impactful passage. And we're just going to salt the oats this morning. That's a good, that's a good horse term, all right? We're just going to salt the earth, oats. We're just going to touch on a few points in this passage. And hopefully you'll say, but I've got to get into that passage. I've got to learn more because it's, 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 it's rich. It's really rich. David is writing this passage. It's kind of an experiential passage, it's, and it's a very relational passage, but that's David. And we get wonderful insight into discovering more and more about David because we get to hear his heart as he writes. In Acts chapter 13, David is, is, is referred to as a man after God's own heart. That has been... I long for that title. I remember when I was a kid, my dad was a pastor, and sometimes when your dad's the pastor up front, and you can listen to this one, all right? When your dad's the pastor up front, it's the same voice behind the pulpit as the one at home. And in, in my negligence as a teen, a lot of times I didn't pay attention like I should have, and I missed out. But there were times, oh, there were times my dad would say stuff, and it just, it really struck. One of the times I remember my dad saying this, he said, I long to have the epitaph of Enoch, that he was a man who walked with God. In fact, when my dad passed and we were discussing what should be put on the marker, and my mom and my sister said, you know, do you have any thoughts or ideas? I remember saying, well, yeah, it's obvious. And, and probably my timing was bad and my tone was too. But because I still remembered him making that statement when I was a teenage boy, teenage guy, him saying, I long, and that's true of my dad. My dad walked with God. And, and Amos, uh, is it 3 3 that says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? Yeah. I mean, that's the testimony of Enoch. And that was the testimony of my father. But I remember in that same message, he was in Acts chapter 13, that David was a man after God's own heart. And even as a teen, I grabbed a hold of that and I said, Oh, Lord, that that would be true of me that I will be a man after your heart one day. Well, we get insight into David's life through the Psalms. We get, we get to see him walk through this relationship with God. But we always have to remember this. The goal is not to learn David. The goal is to discover God. That's David's heart in this. God wants to reveal himself to us, and he does it through the life of David. David is in the wilderness. This is his third time in the wilderness. First time, he's just, he's just a youth and he's taking care of his dad's sheep. And he learns lessons that are going to establish the trajectory of his life 
as a youth in the wilderness. These times of stepping away into missions trips or stepping away in service to the Lord or stepping away in just quietness with God, God wants to meet you and he wants to establish you. And that happened in David's life as a young man. I believe those things were true in David's life even when he went onto that battlefield to face Goliath. And that's a familiar, familiar narrative to us where David goes out because we see a young man full of confidence in God. I don't think David thought he was the man for the job. I believe he fully trusted that God was the God for the job. The hero of that story is not David. The hero of that story is God. And that's why David, when he approaches Goliath, he's not going at Goliath between from one rock to a bush to a ditch. What does scripture tell us? He runs at that giant. Absolute confidence in his God. He discovered those truths, I believe, in the wilderness, even as a youth. And then he's on the run from Saul. That's his second time in the wilderness. And we see his understanding of the faithfulness of God, even when he sneaks down into Saul's camp with Abishai, his nephew, and they find Saul sleeping. And Abishai, who is one of David's mighty men, appeals to his uncle and says, let me hit him with my staff, my lance. Let me hit him with my spear. And, and this, is, this is just how Abishai rolled. He said, it will only take one blow. And so what is he saying to David? David, let me, let me kill him, right? And then no more running, no more hiding in caves, no more mingling with the Philistines and acting like you're crazy, right? We're done. Just let me do it. And David says, we will not lay our hand against God's anointed. We wait on God. These are the truths that God established in a young man named David. But in Psalm 63, he's not a young man. He's an old man. And he's not on the run from a giant. He's not on the run from a king whose throne he would take. He is on the run from his son. Mm. Absalom seeks to take his father's life that he would take his father's throne. Yeah. And that circumstance is when David writes, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary that I may see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. Amen. Thus I will bless you while I live. My lips shall pray. Oh, hang on. You got it right up there. That's good. We'll just go right along. Uh, to see your power, because your loving kindness is better. My lips shall praise you, thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift my hands in your name. Amen. David's got one plan in all of this. Seek God. The question I have to ask myself every day, the question that my dog has to ask, and I'll do my best to hold him back because he's such a high energy animal. <laughs> the question my dog has to ask every day and answer every day, the question my steer has to answer every day, this question my horse answer has, is just this question. So who's in charge? Who's in charge? And by David's words, he affirms, it's God. God is plan A, B, C, and D. I seek God. I looked for you in the sanctuary that I may see your power and your glory. That picture of intimacy that David has, that picture of fellowship and relationship that we can have with God through Jesus Christ by simply trusting in Christ's finished work on our behalf his death, his burial, his resurrection, we can enter into fellowship with God, relationship with God. And a, wow, what a relationship, right? That no matter where I go, this relationship goes with me. No matter my circumstances, no matter when I get down, no matter the times I'm really excited, no matter the times I have a hard time seeing it, God is there. Yeah. Because God is a keeper of his promises. And David knew that. He placed his trust and his faith in the fact that God is a keeper of his promises. He's committed to God. Because David answers this question this way when he says, because your loving kindness is better than life. I get myself in trouble when I start to believe that life is better than his loving kindness. Where I start to say things like, well, you know what? It'd be really great if I had God plus. Yeah. Yeah. I would be content if only I had God and David doesn't do that. 
But we build expectations. I build expectations. I always think when I was a kid, I saw these, these, these paintings made by uh, Norman Rockwell, and he's one of my favorite artists, and I like a lot of Western artists too, uh, Chris Owen and Tim Cox and guys like that. But, but um, I liked Norman Rockwell paintings, if you're familiar with him, because they're just real. Like some art, and I have children that are artists, and my wife is artistic, and my daughter, bless her, just finished her freshman year, and she loves art, and she was going to college for art, and, and we had a wonderful discussion, and I said, that's really great, honey, but there's a reason they call them starving artists. <laughs> and so she is pursuing her degree in graphic design, and she'll get a side thing in fine arts, right? So it'll pay the bills. Um, but I, I love art, but there is art that I look at that I'm like, Nope. But that's not Norman Rockwell. It was just real and it was relatable. And he, he wrote or he painted four paintings, four paintings called freedom paintings. One was called the freedom of speech. One, and that was a, a man standing up in like a town hall meeting and, and, and just being able the freedom to speak out. One was called freedom from fear. And that was uh, two children being tucked into bed by their mother with their father standing over. The third was called the freedom uh, uh, of religion. And it was, it's kind of a, uh, a side picture of people praying. And the fourth was called freedom from want. Freedom from want. And it's a picture of a table that is just loaded with food. And, and people are gathered around, and it looks like Thanksgiving. I don't know if it's Thanksgiving. They don't say it's Thanksgiving, but it looks like Thanksgiving. And everybody's around, and they're all laughing and having a good time. And multiple generations are represented there. And, and the patriarch, Grandpa, he's at the end, and he's getting ready to carve the turkey that, that Grandma is bringing in to set onto the table. And so she's leaning forward with the turkey, and everybody's happy. And as a kid, I took a snapshot and said, that's what Thanksgiving is supposed to look like. When we all get together as a family, this is what it will be. Uh, we haven't quite hit it yet. In our family, and I love my family, when we are all together, there's a lot of different passions represented around that table and a lot of different opinions. And sometimes there is great joy and we laugh and we have a good time together. But what I did is I built this expectation, an unrealistic expectation of this is what it was supposed to look like. In fact, it's so unrealistic that really... As an adult looking at that painting, I realized that couldn't happen. Not that everybody couldn't be having a good time, not that everybody couldn't be gathered by that, but grandma's holding on to a bird that's every bit of 16 to 20 pounds. She's leaning out over the table to set it down. She's smiling too, and I'm like, unless grandma's been doing P90X or maybe steroids, there's no way grandma can sustain that bird without shooting right into that table. It's totally unrealistic. Then people will be smiling, yeah, but no. I build expectations, and I'm going, to, I'm going to venture to say maybe you do too. David's in a place where he, his expectations could have been exposed to say, but this is the season in life where I don't have to learn new things. This is the season in life where things were supposed to go smoother, but that's not him, right? What does he say? No, because your loving kindness is better than life. God, God is it. God is the one who satisfies me. Thus I will praise you with my mouth, I will lift my hands, I will bless you while I live. Um, <clears throat> my soul is satisfied as with, far, with, 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 with marrow and fatness. I'm satisfied with God. It's the same words he says at the beginning of 20, Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I've got God and that's all that I need. Yeah. My soul is satisfied with, farrow, with marrow and fatness, sorry. And so, and then he's going to go on. There we go. Thanks. And when I remember, uh, and, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Then he's going to give us an insight into this when he says this. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. I look at that and I say, how can I have what David has? How can I get there? Thank you, Steve. He's very friendly, waving his hand back there. That means <laughs> land the plane, land the plane. All right. How, that's, that's the insight right there. That's, that, those are the same words that Isaiah gives us this when, when he says, um, I will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on me because you trust in me. David says this where he's, he says, when I remember on, your, on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. And that's why I started memorizing this. And this is why I started meditating on it. Because I wasn't. Because I was up at night. Because I've been a professional warrior for way too long. And I would go to bed thinking on things that would keep me awake. 
And I thought, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Well, how do, I, how do I get past that? Well, I get past it the way that David prescribes it even in Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates. Here's the key, ready? Because he's going to tell us there's only two times, only two times we have to think about God. Doesn't that make that easier? Yeah, yeah where he says, I med- when, when I, uh, I delight, uh, but my delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law I meditate day and night. Whew, that makes it easier. There's only twice I have to think about God. <laughs> day and night. A.W. Tozer said this. This is, this is a loose uh, paraphrase of one of his quotes where he said, when our, where our mind goes, when it can go, where it will, exposes who we are or who we soon will be. As a young man, I had a mentor of mine challenge me with this. Wouldn't it be amazing that when you daydreamed, you would daydream about God? That when my mind can wander, it would just wander to him, not to my points of discontentment, not to my fears or worries, to him, that I would be so consumed with him that my mind would be on him. Well, let's use the dog real quick if we can wake him up. Amos, let's go. Amos, come on. Like the wind. Cool. Steady, easy, easy. Um, he's been old since I got him, and he was nine weeks old then. So uh, this, is, this, is, this is Amos. Um, and uh, he got his name, and I, maybe I'll share this with you. He got his name for two reasons. Uh, he's a blue tick coon hound, by the way. Uh, he got his name Amos because, and by the way, when I came in and I heard the music, I'm like, I'm among my people. Thank you, guys. That's really great. I love it. Grew up in Virginia. I'm like, oh, yeah, keep playing. Um, he got his name Amos because as I just think it, as a hound, it just sounds right. <laughs> Depends on how you say it, but if you say Amos, it's not a big deal. But if you say Amos that, that's, that's it. The other reason he got his name is because uh, Amos in the Bible was a husbandman. He was a man of, of the land who was called out of that to be a mouthpiece for God. And I believe that that's true. Sometimes we look at strength analysis and we say, well, how could I ever be that for God? And we forget the story of a shepherd boy. And God said, I'll, I'll just use him. I'm just going to use him. It's about God. So Amos doesn't need to be a hound. He just has to be obedient, right? So that's why, that's why he got his name. But with Amos, it's really, his life is pretty simple. Amos, come heal. Where I go, he goes. When I stop, he learns to stop. When I, Amos, come heal. When I go, he goes. Now, when I got my dog, and this is true of all my dogs, um, he started on a leash because we have 650 acres, and it's a real, it's, it's, a, it's a dog's paradise. There are so many trees to mark, so many bushes, and amazing things to roll in, and basically all the horse manure you can eat. So it's, it's, it's a pretty sweet setup when it comes to dogs and stuff like that. But, but he's a hound, and he lives through his nose. I mean, that's how he processes life in comparison, real quick here, in comparison to how his nose works compared to how our nose works. If we were to put it into the sense of taste, it would be like this. If I took a spoon of sugar and put it into a glass of water and stirred it, you would taste that water and say, oh, there's something sweet in here. If I took a spoon of sugar and put it into three Olympic-sized swimming pools full of water and stirred it up, he would taste it and say, oh, there's something sweet in here. That's how strong his nose in. He is. He lives life through his nose. The default for him is to always go back to his instinct, his own way of thinking. That's what we see David not do. He, David embraces Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, 3, 5, and 6, and 7, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Verse 7, and be not wise in your own eyes. Come on. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. That's a big word in there, that word all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him. Because when I don't, when I don't do that, what am I saying? I say, I know better. I know better. I constantly am asking Amos to say, don't think through your nose, just watch me. So he does basic obedience stuff, and we got rid of the leash a long time ago because he just doesn't need it anymore. The leash, what does the leash do? The leash is there because he has to be. I want something stronger than a leash in his life. I want a relationship. God wants more than just duty out of you. He wants more than, he wants a relationship with you. So if I ask him to do things like Amos, down, he understands that his job is just to be obedient. Or Amos, sit, sit. Don't get too, don't get too comfortable. No, sit, sit. 
Good boy. Stay. All right. And then this one, this one, he really blew it last week on this one. This is, this is one of his, it's just, he does, he does a great job when he does this well. We'll, we'll give it a try. Amos. No, no, no. Amos, sit. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? All right. This is your moment, man. This is it. Build it. Find it. Ready? Amos. Holler. Holler. Amos. Holler. Okay, it's a little there. He whimpered. Did anybody catch that? Into the mic, man. Into the mic. You ready? Oh, come here, come here, come here. Come here. It's all good. Amos, Amos, holler. 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 Amos, holler. You're, you're killing me, man. You're killing me. All right. The steer does better than this. Amos, you ready? Holler. Okay, close. You ready? Holler. Holler. Oh, oh. Are you ready? Oh, Hank, excuse us, just a minute. Just scratch. Okay, good. Ready? Holler. Holler. There it is. Holler. Oh, there it is. Good boy. All right. Come. Come here. Yo. Good boy. Stay. And I need a volunteer. Okay, so who was on the Kenya trip? Are you, are you a dog person? Yes. Oh, cool. Come on up. All right. And your name is? Chloe. Chloe. This is Amos. Say hi to Amos. You can just rub him all over. Very good. Keep rubbing. He'll give you about an hour to stop that. Okay. <laughs> good. And Chloe, could you just walk over there just for me a little bit? There. Hope oh, that's good right there. Perfect. All right. And I'm just going to have you call Amos. All right. And 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 I'm just going to ask him to stay. Okay. Stay. Go ahead. Amos. Stay. Amos. Oh, yeah. With passion. Amos. Stay. Amos. Stay. Amos. 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 Okay, stop. <laughs> did, you, did you see what happened there? Because that's the best thing that could have happened right there. What did he do? Right, so he, he looked at Chloe. What is Chloe offering? All amazing things. She loves me. Why wouldn't I go over there? Why wouldn't he go over there? Because I said stay. And so even processing something that is good in life, what does he do? He looks back to me and say, I really want that if it's okay with you. His mind is on me. Thank you, Chloe. Give Chloe a hand. She did a great job. Thank you. And that's why we can even ask him to do things that don't make sense to him. All right? Like this. Down. Good boy. Amos. Commando. 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 Good boy. Good boy. Okay. Good boy. Come. Come. Amos, come. Good boy. These people say, why did you teach your dog to do that? Come here. Why wouldn't you teach your dog to do that? It's like the, it's like the coolest thing ever. You know, because if we got fire, it's like, get down, stay low, you know, zombie apocalypse, whatever. We're, we're ready. Yeah. To have our mind stayed on God. Here, and one last illustration, okay? It's the picture that he gives us when he says, because well, when I remember my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Why? Because you have been my help. Psalm 91 puts it this way. The Lord is my refuge. Not that he provides a refuge. He is my refuge. May he provide a refuge? Yes. But I seek him, not my own understanding of what it looks like. Then he says this. Therefore, under the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. Last story. When I was a kid in the mountains of Virginia, um, we moved down there. My dad took the pastorate. I was eight years old. And the church l welcomed us. They were so loving. And uh, they wanted to affirm us as kids moving down there. So uh, there were folks in the church that bought my sister a, a kitten. And um, that was a way of just saying, this is home now, right? So they bought her a kitten. But me... They gave me two chickens. I, I love livestock. I love the barn. And so chickens, I'm like, this is like the coolest thing ever. I have my own chickens. And they were a, a rooster and a hen. And, uh, and they were, I, I affectionately named them Henry and Henrietta. And, and, and they were fighting cock roosters. Now, down, down in the mountains, th there's lots of fighting cocks down there. And they keep them out in the yard. So they had these little four-by-four four pens. 
and, and, and every one of those pens had their own rooster, and they were really beautiful roosters, and that's why they kept them, right? They just liked looking at them because they were so pretty. They would fill their yards with these because they were so ornamental. At least that's what they told me when I was eight. When I was older, I learned, yeah, but then they go over to Kentucky on the Friday and Saturday night, and they make a little side money, or they ship them over to the Philippines. But anyway, they give me these two fighting cock chickens, a rooster and a, and a hen, and, and, uh, and they had the run of the barnyard. And it was not long until... Henrietta brought forth, right? And she had these chicks. And, and, and I remember the day I was down in the garden and I was weeding the garden. And, and I, I'd seen this before. Henrietta would have her little chicks around her. And these crows would come and they would try and snatch away these chicks. Just grab them and fly. And every time the crows would show up, she would swell to like three times her size. You know? And she'd the... And these chicks would all run underneath her because there was safety under her wings. One day, the crows showed up, and she did her, and all but one ran underneath her. One ran to the tall grass because it made sense. Hide. And the crow swooped down and grabbed that chick and started to fly off with it. And Henrietta, because fighting cocks can go pretty feral, and they can fly for short distances, she shot up and she hits this crow. And this chick falls down and she hits the ground. Boop, 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 everybody in <laughs> over there too, right? Because ah. That's what David's talking about. Because it's easy to choose my own understanding and, and jump in the grass. But true security is only found under the wing of God, to seek after him. But that's a commitment, right? That's a commitment. Amos, down. And that's the core of all relationship is commitment. And that's why at the conclusion of this psalm, David says this. Despite all of his circumstances, he says, but the king shall rejoice in God. Yeah. And all that swear by him shall be blessed. Commitment. This is my uh, Texas skip. It works just like this. We'll see how we can get it fired up here. This is when it's dangerous to be in the front row, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hang on. This is working as good as the holler. Sorry. We just got to be a little more, a little more committed. Here we go. Okay, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. Okay, give me just a minute there. Why I love that trick is because it's a great trick that shows commitment. When it comes to the Texas skip, you're on one side or you're on the other, but you can't, you can't hang out in the middle. There you go. And I see the life of David and I see a man committed to God, even in the, the most difficult of circumstances. And it reminds me of this. When I consider, how do I put it? I look at the life of David, his commitment to God, but how overwhelming yeah. is God's commitment to us? I look at my relationship with God and I say, I need to take it serious, but how serious does God take it? So serious that he would sacrifice his son for me. He doesn't play games when it comes to commitment. God is the picture of what commitment is and would be and willingly send his son that we might have relationship with him. Commitment. So he concludes with that. The king shall rejoice in God. So let me just leave you with a couple questions. Here's the first one, right? So who's in control? Who's in charge? Amen. <laughs> who's supposed to be right? Who's in charge? How committed are we 
to God, as evidenced by this, what consumes our thoughts. When your mind can wander, where it can, when, it, when, it, when it can wander, where it wants to wander, where does it wander to? Pastor Timothy Keller said this. He said, through knowledge, we can grasp an understanding of the attributes of God. But through Christian life experience, the attributes of God grasp us. On, that's, that's what we see in the testimony of David. And that's why in Acts chapter 13, he is called a man after God's own heart. Because there is something unique about his relationship with God? No. It says he was a man after God's own heart because he would do the will of God. And so can you, and so can I. We can all be people after God's own heart. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. Thank you for the dry weather that let many of us get our hay in the barn. You know our needs beyond even what we comprehend. Thank you for your servant, David. And thank you for the, th the things that we can learn of you as we look at this life of David. Yes. And God, perhaps there's people here this morning that are saying, concerning this season of life, they're saying, ah, it wasn't supposed to look like this. Yeah. Yeah. God, we carry expectations. Help us, Lord, to just check those at the door yes. and say, God, we just trust you. You are our refuge. God, help us to be consumed by you, that our thoughts would ever be toward you. Thank you, Father, for your commitment toward us in what your Son, Jesus Christ, did for us. His commitment to you. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So, Lord, we just want to praise you. We want to thank you for the joy of being together. And, Lord, would you stir us each morning to be willing to ask this question before we enter into the day, each morning. So who's in charge today? Yes. We love you, God. Thank you for your blessings and your goodness. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.